This is What Do You Bring to the Table, a nonprofit project made by youth for youth that aims to explore the many, many career paths available within our Canadian food systems. By interviewing industry leaders across the country, we get a first hand look at the various existing and emerging agri food career opportunities with a particular focus on equity and sustainability. We want to thank the Gailey Foundation for their generosity in supporting this project, as well as the Catherine and Maxwell Megan Foundation and the Peterborough K.M. Hunter Charitable Foundation. Please visit our website youthinfoodsystems.ca and sign up for our free monthly e-newsletter to stay involved. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Links to those are on our website. If you like what we're doing, please drop a like, review, or comment. Or, if you have the means to, contribute with a monetary donation through our website. Thanks for listening! This is episode 6, Akshatha and Eckerd. Hello everyone, my name is Akshita and I volunteer at Youth in Food Systems. I'm honored to be interviewing Eckerd Lutz, an educator who is very involved in the green industries program and engages youth through schools and green industries at Glenview Park Secondary School at WRDSB. So hello Mr. Lutz, how are you today? How are you? I'm fine. Um, it's been a busy day, but I'm excited to do this. That's great, I'm so excited. So shall we start? Absolutely. So can you tell me um, a little bit about your role as a green industries educator? What does a day in your life look like for you? It's pretty diverse. So you never know what's going to happen. It's kind of like my background in farming. You're dependent on the weather and what up lesson plans go out the window. But when it comes right down to it, I think it's nurturing people, uh, animals, our livestock at school and plants. So. Um, when I say people, I mean students, staff, community members, and um, just constantly always learning, always being on the lookout for new information, new ways of delivering my curriculum and my course, just to keep up with the times and keep everyone engaged. Yeah, so you must you must have to be very current with the times and what's happening when it comes to green industries. Current could be Bloomberg on the drive into work. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's that some days it's that current. It's what, what's happening in the world. For example, when the, the war started in the Ukraine, and that obviously had um, major impacts on our food, food supply around the world. So that was a topic of discussion at that point in time. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And so what path led you to this role? What educational background basically brought you here? Uh, that's a pretty crazy path. Uh, like many people, I've changed career paths. Um, I grew up on a family farm. So that's my, my original farming background. Uh, my dad was a diesel mechanic and his philosophy was um, you had to go learn a trade before you would be allowed to come back to the farm if you wanted to, to be involved in the farm. His philosophy was that way you farmed because you were passionate about it and not because you had to. You had something else to fall back on. Um, so I actually went to college for computer electronics and I was involved in um, research and development for military sonar. Um, and then from there, I went to teacher's college. Um, I figured out somewhere along the college route uh, through peer tutoring and stuff that I enjoyed teaching people. Um, and I was seemed pretty good at it. And um, so I went off to teacher's college, but then ended up going back to, the, to my roots and to the farm and uh, farmed for quite a number of years. And then only in the last 20 years, got back into teaching, so. It's been a very crazy path. Yeah. And so what is your favorite thing about your job then? Sharing my passion, my farm. Um, the fact that I, I'm passionate about teaching people and I'm passionate about agriculture. So the fact that I get to morph those two things into a job and get paid for it mm -hmm. is unbelievable. Um, yeah. So that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, and just seeing, being able to share that passion with students 
and uh, yeah, that's yeah, that, that that's makes the cool sense. Thing. And so, what is the most challenging then? Most challenging, um, re-engaging some students with the real world, and that's partly makes me sad to see how disengaged a lot of young people are with what I call the real world, the things around them, things you touch, feel, um, and do for real instead of just watching them on your phone, watching other people do it. That's really sad and so becoming more and more difficult to, to break that trend. Um, for some people, other people, you bring them into the classroom, you expose them to these things and they engage right away. But for some, it's, it's such an addiction now that it's so hard to break that addiction and, and get them re-engaged with real plants, real animals, real activities, not the virtual world. Yes, that makes sense. And so, what do you think are the most impactful innovations or strategies that are being implemented in the green industry today, in your opinion? Um, I, so, as an industry, I would say technology. But I, in our program here, it's the partnerships. In the green industries program, it's by far our partnerships. Uh, we partner with our hospitality program at school here with the chef. Um, with our what we call our Panther Pantry, so that's our school meal program um, for for students and families who need that support, and um, local community community gardens um, that are close to the school here, and the youth and food systems program. So all these partnerships are, are probably the biggest thing for us. Okay. Okay. And so what's the current, in your opinion, what's the current state and effects of the manufacturing industry through the lens of climate change? It's a very yeah, it's a deep question, but... I think a lot of people think of, like, when they think of green industries, um, they're thinking of it more from an industrial perspective, and it's a, it's a combination of so many industries, like... In, green, in the high school green industries curriculum, we cover everything from forestry, forestry, agriculture, uh, landscape, and horticulture. So there's not one industry sector per se, and they're all evolving in their own areas. Um, so that answer has so many different facets to it. It's yeah. almost impossible. Hey, that makes yeah. sense. So um, how important do you think is environmental sustainability in farming and like in agriculture? It's huge. Um, I think it's always been part of agriculture. Farmers have always strived to um, you know, be sustainable and take care of the environment. It's just the nature of the industry. What I think has changed is our interpretation of that and our understanding of what it means to be sustainable. Um, look back years ago when people farmed like, horses and oxen and so on and to you know, the industrial revolution and mechanizing that to now um, automating it to, to a whole new level and in between there you have the introduction of the chemical industry and so on so um, I think as the industry has evolved our understanding of what, what is sustainable has also evolved um, one of the things I strive to do in the program here at school is to introduce students to everything from conventional agriculture to all the alternatives, whether it be um, true organic or other forms of no-till, minimal till, um, all the modern technologies and, and conventions that we're using. And then instead of indoctrinating them that one is better than the other, I challenge them to look at the pros and cons of each of the systems and and challenge them to be part of the solution. Like maybe one of the students sitting in front of me in my class pursues a career and, and post-secondary education in an ag or hort-related field, and maybe they're the ones that come up with the better solution than what we present. Which I think we haven't seen the best solutions yet. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so that's, and, and just as an example of that, like a lot of people would say, well, you know, 
modern agriculture you know, is not sustainable, and we need to go you know, totally no-till, no chemical, no whatever. Everybody should be growing their own food in their backyard, and these are all very ideal, ideology, ideological. Yeah, there we go. Um, awesome ideas, but then you look globally instead of just in our backyard. And you see millions of people displaced by wars and, and you know weather and climate change and so on. And you say, okay, they have no backyard. They can't grow food. They need food, and it has to be cheap enough that the rest of the world can provide it to them. So, how do you do that, right? So there's ethical questions that come with some of these ideologies of how we should grow. Yeah, so like it, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with people's resources and accessibility to certain stuff. Yeah. Definitely. And so, back to teaching, which has been more valuable in your career? Is it the education, what you learned from it personally, or the experience? So teaching kids, teaching your students. I think both. Well, when you say experience, I, I, I was thinking like your experience from actually industry and and working with it that way, and what we do here at school. Um, I think they're both equal. You can't. It's like the chicken and the egg. You can't say one is more valuable than the other. Mm-hmm. The education that you have leads to meaningful experiences, and then those experiences though they can't evolve. If you're not willing to keep educating yourself, yeah. so if it if if they're both going to be successful, they both have to work hand in hand. Yeah, that makes sense. And what would you advise to youth who want to walk in your footsteps? Um, <laughs> if you want to walk in my footsteps, um, I would say you can't walk in somebody else's footsteps. Mm-hmm. Um, period. You have to find your own passion, um, whatever that is. You have to work hard at it. You have to become the best you, you can be in that field. Um, and then you have to be willing to. The biggest thing is share your knowledge with other people. Um, work together, because in doing so, you both grow. It's that synergy of, you know, sharing and creating a win-win scenario. Um, that's been probably. The root of my success is that willingness to um, pursue my passion, but also to share everything I've learned with people. Whether it was when I was in industry, when I was farming full time, um, sharing with other producers and growers, instead of trying to, you know, keep it to myself and be a little bit better than everybody else. Because when you start to share, other people share. You work together. Everybody grows. Things move ahead. Definitely, that makes sense. And so, what's one of the most significant changes you've observed in the green in- industries and its policies? Um, I would say the development and of technology and the speed of the adaptation of that, uh, the rate of development, and the speed of adaptation for years, for generations, I would almost say. We did the same thing after we mechanized farming. We kind of chugged along doing the same thing for a few generations, and not a whole lot changed.、Um, and the rate of change now is phenomenal.、Uh, if you're not keeping pace with new technologies, new practices,、um, new equipment, new genetics.、Um, You're not you're not going to be current for long. So that that I feel has been probably the biggest change. Okay. So what type of new like policies have changed? Would you mind giving some examples or new equipment so, like that?、Um, the automation of equipment,、uh, whether it be robots harvesting in greenhouses or fully autonomous.、Uh, Tractors and so on、um, coming down the pipe, that type of, and then just the computerization and monitoring of everything from 
planting to application of nutrients to monitoring the harvesting so that you know every square foot of your field what the crop was like how much it produced what uh, you know what the deficiencies potentially were so you can modify for the following year that type of information gathering and, and resource is is exponentially increasing so that's a huge change okay okay that makes sense and so this is a little bit of a deeper question so what policies do you think should be implemented to accelerate the development and growth of green industries to transition towards a low carbon economy i would say the biggest thing you need to do if you want to go in that direction is incentivize it um, you know, it's the type of thing that is hard to regulate uh, so if we want to see that shift it has to be through an incentivized program whether it be financial incentives market access incentives um, it's just regulation i think well, what we're seeing globally is is uh it's not not successful so an incentive based program will be whatever it is the change that um, we're trying to to incorporate it has to be an incentivized program okay. that way people buy it okay and what type can you give some examples of what types of changes or incentives anything from adaptation of new technologies new practices um, just all those sorts of things that depends on the industry and what it is and whether it's in the landscape industry and agriculture and forestry um, it has to be create created through a source of incentives so that the population the people involved in the industry that everyone is is buying into it and that it's a communal effort um, it's not not the type of thing that that I don't think we can successfully regulate okay that makes sense you know, that makes sense and coming back to your personal job what are some of your greatest strengths and weaknesses throughout your job I would say greatest strengths um, work ethic from growing up growing up on a farm. So that that ideology of every thing has a season and it needs to get done and when it needs to get done there might be a long day. Um, a broad skill set when you grow up in that sort of environment you you get exposed to so many different things um, and then adding on to it my technology background from my schooling. Um, so that broad skill set and then just passion for what you're doing um, my biggest um, downfall probably spreading myself too thin um, and then having to reel it back in realizing when when you've taken on too many things and you get to the point where even through delegation you need to just pull it back in a little bit get a few things off your plate. Mm-hmm, definitely. And what is your goal for the youth you're teaching? Just to end our interview off. My goal? Um, to to uh, probably pass my passion on to them in whatever area. Usually I find that out of all the five sectors that we teach that students will engage in one or two of those with with much more passion than the others so they might like landscape design and floristry because they're more artistic and they don't exactly like you know working with soil per se or with livestock uh, others are more hands-on and they like working with the animals and working with paving stone and so on but helping them find something within the green industries program that they can be passionate about and 
is awesome when you get to see them engage in it outside of school. So when they take plants home out of the greenhouse and they spend their whole summer growing in garden that their family never had before, or they come back in September and they say, we, we built a new patio in our backyard and um, you know, I helped lay this down and do all the, the installing of that patio. So just seeing that, um, is great satisfaction. Hey, okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much for letting us interview you and I wish you the best of luck with the youth that you'll be teaching. And I know for a fact that the the youth will be so um, inspired by your education. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. Bye now. We hope you enjoyed this episode of What Do You Bring to the Table, a project of Seeds of Diversity's Youth and Food Systems Program. Thanks again to the Gay Lee Foundation, the Catherine and Maxwell Megan Foundation, and the Peterborough K.M. Hunter Charitable Foundation. And of course, thanks to you for listening. See you again soon.